It is now time for oral questions. And I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, just on behalf of Ontario's uh, New Democrats and our New Democratic Caucus, I want to thank Tanya for all of her amazing uh, support and work over the years. She truly has been a, a, a wonderful woman uh, and uh, a beautiful personality to work with uh, here in the chamber and uh, throughout all of the work that she's done. So thanks, thanks Tanya, and good luck. Uh, speaker, if you'll indulge me just one more time, can I just say Oski Wee Wee? Yeah. Hamilton won their game. Uh, yesterday, and uh, looking forward to um, meeting up with Toronto this coming weekend. Uh, but my, my question is actually a, a bit more serious, Speaker, in terms of topics, and it's for the Premier. As we know, Ontarians are rightly alarmed and a little bit worried about what's happening with uh, COVID-19 these days. Uh, of course, we all have seen our cases climb up to around the 1,000 mark on a daily basis. Uh, at this point, 9,994 Ontarians have lost their lives. I haven't got the stats from today, so that quite, might quite actually be the grim milestone of 10,000 by now. If not, it'll happen this week, likely. The Omicron variant, as people know, uh, Omicron variant is extremely contagious uh, and is in several countries around the world, including here in our uh, country, in our province. Question. There are lots of unknowns uh, about uh, whether the vaccines actually work on this particular variant. So my question simply to the Premier is, uh, what's he doing to ensure Ontarians uh, that they're protected from this latest variant, especially as we make plans to get together with loved ones over the holidays? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. I thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for a question. But before I answer it, let me also say that on behalf of the government, we also recognize and thank Tanya very much for your years of dedicated service and uh, your, uh, your knowledge of this place, but also your incredible personality. And we can still see you smile even though you have the mask on. So thank you. Thank you for your service. But in answer to the Leader of the Opposition's question, uh, this, of course, is a concern for many of us. The uh, best option, of course, is to stop the Omicron variant from uh, getting across the border. Uh, and so we are very pleased with the steps that the federal government has taken so far to ensure that uh, we are uh, testing all people who have returned or traveled from South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini, Mozambique, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. But of course, we recognize that there may be others that may need to be added to the list since the two people who have already been diagnosed were traveling from Nigeria. So I would expect that other locations are going to be identified. And that's why we are continuing to ask the federal government to ensure that everyone is tested Response. that comes into Canada, regardless of where they come from. This is one of the most important things that we need to do to protect Ontarians. And I'll speak further in the supplemental. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, on the weekend, Dr. Uni, the head of the science table, said the, that the Omicron uh, virus uh, sp uh, spreads faster than the Delta virus, or so the, the Omicron strain, rather, spreads even faster than Delta. The Premier may recall uh, that um, he justified finally giving Ontario uh, workers three paid sick days because the spread of Delta was faster than the initial coronavirus strain in Ontario. So uh, at that time, the Minister of Labour that uh, said uh, sick days are, and I quote, to ensure that we continue to get people vaccinated as quickly as possible and protect workers sick from this virus. Well, the same threat is with us today, Speaker, and it seems to be getting worse. Will the Premier be extending paid sick days beyond December 31st and making them permanent for Ontario workers? And to apply the government host group. The question from uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as uh, the Opposition Leader will know, that uh, uh, we took steps uh, immediately uh, when COVID-19, at the beginning of the pandemic, to ensure that our workers uh, uh, who were impacted uh, uh, by COVID-19 were protected. Uh, uh, speaker, we also, the, as you know, the, the Premier negotiated a, an over $1 billion uh, uh, program of paid sick days uh, with the federal government. We're going to continue to work with the federal government to ensure uh, uh, that programs to, uh, to support Canadians throughout COVID continue to happen, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to uh, uh, ensure that uh, workers have access to, uh, uh, to paid sick days. Thank you. And the final supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, regardless of the recasting of history, we do have an important opportunity now uh, to do the right thing moving forward. 17 schools have closed due to COVID-19. 712 schools have uh, reported cases. Sudbury, Kings Kingston and Algoma are responding with new restrictions. New variant uh, Omicron is already here in Ontario, as I've already mentioned, and has an, agno been acknowledged by the Minister of Health. So the question is, will the Premier commit to extending paid sick days beyond December 31st and to make them permanent so that we can actually protect working people, keep them safe, and reduce the spread of the Omicron virus? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I'm not sure why the Leader of the Opposition has to always go to the negative. This is what the province of Ontario has accomplished in its fight against COVID-19. We have ensured that workers are safe. We've ensured that they have access to paid sick days. The Minister of Education has ensured that our students have a return to school protocol that is safe, including investments uh, in, in air purification. We've ensured that our medical officers of health across the 34 different regions have the tools that they need uh, to fight COVID-19 in their areas. The Minister of Health has made sure that our frontline workers, frontline healthcare workers, have the tools that they need, Mr. Speaker. That is what has led to Ontario having one of the world-leading uh, uh, vaccinations. Uh, um, almost 90% uh, have a, a double dose uh, or a single dose and approaching 90% on, on both doses, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing tremendous uptake Response. with uh, uh, kids from 5 to 11, Mr. Speaker. I think Ontario has done a great job. There's more work to be done, and we will continue to do the work that is necessary to lead Canada and to lead North America. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks so much, Speaker. Speaker, my next question is also uh, for the Premier. Um, the Premier tweeted last week during his blustery comments regarding Barry Condo owners uh, that, I quote, a contract is a contract and must be respected. Meanwhile, he let the 407 off the hook for a billion dollars in penalties stemming from their contract. The company started negotiating to break their contract with the government back in March of last year, and yet they still made $148 million in profits from tolls. Looks like a contract is a contract unless the Premier decides it's time to rip it up. How on earth can the Premier explain a billion dollar write-off to corporate owners of 407? helping his buddies, while surgeries, diagnostics are still backlogged, and while schools are still not safe from COVID-19. Mr. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. As she knows, the COVID-19 pandemic had significant impacts on traffic levels on the 407 as well as Ontario's roads and highways. And these were unprecedented circumstances as Ontarians complied with stay-at-home orders while fighting multiple waves of COVID-19. And this resulted, Mr. Speaker, in the 407 invoking the relief clause under its contract with the Ministry of Transportation. Speaker, at the end of the day, this is a contractual issue. But our government took immediate action at the beginning of the pandemic to bring relief to drivers by freezing tolls on the 407 East, on the 412, and the 418 to deliver more relief to drivers. Mr. Speaker, the opposition talks about standing up for drivers. But the, Liberals, the NDP stood by while the Liberals, under Stephen Del Duca, when he was Minister of Transportation, signed a contract Spons. in 2015 that, that locked drivers into tolls on the 412 and the 418. Oh, We're focused, Mr. Speaker, on providing relief for drivers, and that will continue to be our focus. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, you don't throw stones when you live in a glass house. It was the Conservatives that sold the 407 contract in the first place and privatized all of those revenues for their buddies, as opposed to in the benefit of Ontarians. So it's, it's quite actually funny, that uh, response from the, uh, uh, the minister. But look, the 407 does make hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue for their shareholders. That's because that's the way this uh, party that's governing now wanted it to be. But they could have avoided, Speaker, the penalties in their contract altogether by, for example, reducing or eliminating tolls uh, to attract more cars to, their, to the highway, which would have also, frankly, helped Ontarians, Speaker. But instead, they asked Premier Ford for a billion-dollar break, and he gave it to them. Wow. 
worse, a second billion dollar break is on the table for 2021. My question is how, in the depths of this pandemic, could the Premier think a billion dollar penalty to a private company should just be wiped away even as they continue to make huge profits? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, as I, as I said, at the end of the day, this is a contractual issue. In response to the COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, our government took immediate action to provide relief to drivers across the province. We suspended the collection of interest on unpaid toll fees from Highways 407 East, 412 and 418. We froze the scheduled increases to driver and carrier products, like driver's licenses and validation tags. We extended the validity of government driver, vehicle and carrier fees to keep people safe, and we froze the scheduled CPI increase to toll rates on Highways 407 East, 412 and 418 that was scheduled to come into effect on June 1, 2020. Mr. Speaker, we are looking at ways to maintain, to, to, keep, uh, to make life more affordable for Ontarians, especially drivers, as we're going through the next wave of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, we are committed Fonts. to affordability, and that has been our focus since the beginning of the pandemic and will continue to be our focus as we continue to navigate COVID-19. The final supplementary. Well, thanks, Speaker. But in the laundry list, the minister forgot to mention that they gave the 407 a $1 billion gift. Right. Look, they quietly made that decision back in April, behind closed doors. The public didn't have any idea of what the government was up to. They never told the public. The 407's own financial statements, Speaker, show that it continues to make significant profits. And I quote, the company maintains sufficient liquidity and expects to be able to satisfy all of its obligations in 2021. So, as you may know, I've asked the Auditor General to look into this fiasco, but the Premier and his team can clear this up right now. How could the Premier write off a billion dollars of penalties, especially when apparently he believes a contract is a contract and it must be respected. Mr. Mr. Speaker, well, um, if the Leader of the Opposition wants to talk about contracts, I wonder what she had to say back in 2015 when then Minister of Transportation Stephen Del Duca locked a contract in against drivers in Durham Region to pay, pay tolls for 30 years. Our government has never and will never sign a contract like that, Mr. Speaker, and so we certainly won't take any lectures from the Leader of the Opposition on Order. the issue. Unlike the Del Duca Liberals and the NDP who sat by, we're taking action to make life more affordable for Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, we took immediate action to provide relief to drivers across the province, and we're continuing to look for ways to make sure that we provide affordable relief Order. for drivers as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Order. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, as a new threat of a new variant looms large, the Delta variant continues to spread in our schools, and cases are rapidly climbing among our youngest students. Cumulative school cases are now surpassing 7,000, and 17 schools have closed entirely. Something is not working. I wish the Premier would just admit that allowing class sizes to balloon and waiting until mid-November to release a testing plan has put another school year in jeopardy. With the risk profile changing, will he act now to ramp up in-school protections and take home testing before it's too late? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the member opposite that the government, in fact, announced actions to deploy testing, the first in the country to do so to all schools in the province of Ontario, rapid antigen tests for every child going home this holiday to ensure a safe return in January. The government acted well before uh, this variant has entered our shores in the context of strengthening elementary school protocols, restricting lunches to cohorts, ending uh, re requiring virtual uh, events within schools, really with the aim to reduce indirect and direct contact. We've extended the second term funding of $300 million to all schools to help build upon the hiring of over 2,000 staff supporting children. We have one of the lowest case rates for kids under 19 in Canada, and we have one of the highest 
vaccine rates. We're taking nothing for granted. It's the basis for why we announced the extension of PCR take-home tests to all families for symptomatic and asymptomatic purposes. 157,000 kids have signed up to get the vaccine. That is promising. We'll continue to do whatever it takes to keep our school system safe. Supplementary question. Speaker, Speaker, under this minister's watch, Ontario schools were closed longer than any other jurisdiction in North America. And our kids are still feeling and suffering the impact of those closures. You'll excuse me and parents out there for being a little bit skeptical with a response like that from this minister. And I'm going back to the Premier. Four more schools have reported new cases over the weekend in Thunder Bay. There are nine active outbreaks in Durham Region schools and at least 23 schools with outbreaks in Ottawa. In total, 712 schools in this province have cases. The head of the science table has said, we need to try to tread as carefully as we can to avoid more explosive outbreaks in schools. Our kids, our families cannot afford another school closure like last year. Question. What actions is this government going to take today to keep our kids safe and our schools safely open? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's not lost on parents that if the NDP were in power, they would have closed schools and locked down our province for the entire duration of the year. They are the inconsistency of the New Democrats to reopen, Order. followed by a desire to close schools, reopen schools. That is your consistency, the fact that you are not following the best signs and the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who has said the school system has been robust and safe, which is why we've taken nothing for granted. Why weeks ago we announced the expansion of testing in our province, the only only province in Canada to do so with the Order. use of rapid test uh, kits for all children. It's why we have a PCR take-home test. It's why we expanded ventilation in every single school and strengthened the protocols within elementary school. Mr. Speaker, five in six secondary schools have not reported an active case, and today six and seven elementary schools do not have an active case at all. But we take nothing for granted, which is why we extended Fine. funding, we've improved ventilation, and we're working to make testing more available to more families right across Ontario. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, as we know, global supply, supply chain challenges and economic uncertainty have driven prices in our province and many other jurisdictions higher. But Ontarians want to know that their government is taking swift action to ensure that economic certainty and job stability remains now and into the future. All Ontarians deserve to know that their government is taking action to ensure that good jobs are being protected today and into the future. So, Speaker, through you, what is the minister planning to do to help protect Ontarians through these challenging times and to create the right conditions for future economic growth? And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Niagara West for that question, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this economic uh, ad adversity couldn't come at a more challenging time. Uh, that is why we have a plan, a plan to build Ontario. As we all know, we inherited a province from the previous government where real investment in infrastructure never materialized to the, to the level needed. That's why in our 2021 Ontario Economic Statement and Fiscal Review, we have a plan, a plan to support Ontarians by growing this province it, as the best place to, to do business, to work and raise a family. Mr. Speaker, we're going to say yes. We're going to say yes to investing in our health care capacity and investing $30.2 billion over the next 10 years to build, expand and enhance hospitals. Yes to supporting Ontario workers who have fallen behind, including supporting them through minimum wage, and yes to getting shovels in the ground on roads, bridges. And that's why we've invested an additional $2.6 billion in funding to support the uh, Ontario Highways Program, Response. which features more than 580 construction, expansion, and rehabilitation projects. Mr. Speaker, wow, we are saying yes to building the foundation for our future prosperity. That's a lot of fun. Supplementary question. Speaker, and my thanks to the Minister of Finance for that response. I know uh, many of my constituents are very glad to hear that uh, this is a government that has their back. But my constituents also want to ensure that the work that is mo moving Ontario forward to build Ontario up and ensure future economic growth is maintained. Speaker, back to the Minister of Finance. While I appreciate that answer from the Minister, there is always more that can be done. And so could the Minister tell us what the government's plan is uh, to take measures that will support hardest hit Ontarians where they need it most? Again, the Minister of Finance. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for uh, that question. Uh, Speaker, uh, we, as we've said as a government, we are focused on affordability, and we've been for, uh, focused on that since day one. Our government continues to support households with the Ontario electricity rebate for residential customers, small businesses, and farms. And we introduced the LIFT, the Low Income Family Tax Credit, for workers who had fallen behind as well as expanded the care tax credit for families and caregivers. Bill 43 proposes to extend the Seniors Home Safety Tax Credit to help seniors uh, are those living with senior relatives making renovations on their homes to make them safer and more accessible. Speaker, these are just a handful of measures our government is taking to support Ontarians. It's all part of a plan to build Ontario's future. That means getting shovels Response. on the ground for highways, hospitals, housing, schools, and high-speed internet. We're making these investments to improve our health care, and we'll continue to do so in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, a member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, we were once again horrified by another terrible incident in private long-term care. J.C. Ruhala had to intervene to save her father's life. Her father was very ill from a urinary tract infection and moments away from sepsis if his daughter didn't fight the center to call 911 and have him sent to a hospital. That happened at Hawthorne Place, one of the seven private long-term care facilities that were so bad during the pandemic that the military had to be called in and later published a long list of shocking and sickening deficiencies. After this, a hospital administrator temporarily took over, and yet here we are again, as though not a single lesson has been learned. We've seen enough. It's time to pull the plug on profit and long-term care and give residents a second chance at a life where the only priority is their health and dignity, because they deserve so much better than what they're getting. Why won't this government do the right thing and take profits out of long-term care? The government house, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, to be very clear, uh, it is this government that has uh, put uh, uh, significant resources back into the long-term care sector, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are providing uh, uh, a North American leading uh, four hours of care. We're moving to that, uh, that standard, Mr. Speaker. Of course, that's been talked about for a long time in the province of Ontario by both uh, uh, a Liberal government and a, the Liberal NDP coalition from 11 to 14, but never done. This government is doing that with the resources that come with that. Mr. Speaker, we're hiring over 27,000 uh, additional uh, uh, PSWs. We are building over 30,000 uh, uh, new beds across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, every community in this province will have access to a brand new state-of-the-art long-term care facility because of the work that this government is doing, Mr. Speaker. What we won't do is what the NDP are suggesting we do, Spons? put thousands of people out of work so that we can buy and then close down long-term care homes. That's their plan, but that's certainly not our plan. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And this question will show just how similar this Conservative government is to the Liberal government before them. Last week, the NDP private member's bill, the Time to Care Act, was tabled again for the fifth time. This vital bill that would legally guarantee every long-term care resident in Ontario a minimum standard of four hours of direct care per day was voted for unanimously in this House. But whether it's a Conservative or Liberal government, this bill never gets to third reading because it appears that they don't want it to become law, but they also don't have the gall to vote against it. The clock is ticking. We have months before the left the end of this session when all bills that have not been passed into law will die. Will this government, right here, right now, commit to bringing back a Time to Care Act for third reading and vote it into law, or will they make it die once again and show us what they really think? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I truly don't know where the member has been, because this government has already passed uh, that level of care. Mr. Speaker, I just mentioned it, a North American leading level of care, four hours of care. And to support that, we are putting billions of dollars behind that, Mr. Speaker. We are hiring 27,000 new additional PSWs, Mr. Speaker. We are bringing on uh, some 30,000 new long-term care beds in the system, Mr. Speaker. The only people that have never prioritized long-term care, in fact, are the NDP. <laughs> and, of course, the Liberals. So the Liberals built 611 beds, Mr. Speaker. Now, in between 11 and 14, this party, the NDP, held the balance of power. Was long-term care their priority? No. no. Was education their priority? No. no. Was health care their priority? No. no, Mr. Speaker. 
on every single mat thing that matters to the people of the province of Spons. Ontario. The NDP could have put an end to the reign of terror of the Liberal Party, but they chose to support them for a stretch goal in insurance that they never really meant to take uh, happen, Mr. Speaker. Come on. Next question, member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. COVID case counts are rising, and Ontarians are very concerned about the Omicron variant and its impact or the impact that it may have on their lives. Throughout this pandemic, this government has been indecisive and slow to act, and that has led to the unnecessary spread of the virus. It took 400 days, 400 days to get three temporary paid sick days, and that led to the unnecessary spread of the virus. The speaker, we know that parents are going to need these days in the new year to take their children to get their second doses, or for people to go to get their boosters, or for people to stay home because they're sick. Speaker, through you to the Premier, it's about being ready. So, Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing, pass Bill 7 today, and provide 10 permanent paid sick days to every Ontario worker? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, when you talk about being ready, let's be very clear what happened in the province of Ontario during this pandemic. This province was brought to its knees and had to go through the longer lockdowns than any other North American jurisdiction because the previous Liberal government left us unprepared, Mr. Speaker. 800 people in intensive care brought this province to its knees, Mr. Speaker, one of the richest provinces in Canada, if not the richest, and one of the richest jurisdictions Order. in North America, brought to its knees because the previous government never made the investments in long-term care, never made the investments in intensive care, never made the investments to ensure that our frontline workers had access to PPE, Mr. Speaker. On every single matter, Mr. Speaker, Order. the previous Liberal government failed, and in the dying days of their administration, they decided to bring in some sick government days. Side, come to order. Not good enough, and that's why the people of the province of Ontario reduced them to five, six, or seven. Response. I'm not sure what it is, Mr. Speaker, but people of the province of Ontario know that they can rely on this government to get the job done once and for all. Supplementary question. Speaker to the Minister, 400 days. 400 days. Just, and making 10 paid sick days permanent is only part of what this government needs to do. And we know what needs to happen. Make vaccinations mandatory for frontline health care workers and education workers. Ensure an effective vaccine rollout for 5 to 11-year-olds. And make vaccinations universal in schools. Expand third-dose booster el eligibility. Improve ventilation in indoor public settings like schools continue vaccine certificates, expand access to rapid testing, and stop the harassment of our frontline health care workers and families. So, Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing and address these gaps, or is he still planning to end vaccine certificates and the pandemic on January 17th? <laughs> Minister of Health to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, well, our government is taking the necessary steps. As of today, we have 89.9 per cent of the population 12 and up having received their first dose, 87 per cent having received two doses. We have appointments for 5 to 11-year-olds booked, 157,900. We've also had 69,000 children aged 5 to 11 vaccinated within the last week which is 6.4% of that population group, and obviously the appointments are being booked. We're encouraging everyone, especially with the Omicron variant now in the province of Ontario, to please get vaccinated. And we're making sure that we are going to expand the number of people who can go for the booster doses in different age groups. We'll have more to say about that in the next week. So we are taking every step possible that we can take Response. to protect the people of Ontario. Thanks. Thank you. The next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry. Last week, I saw there was a news conference with that minister, the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade, about investing in a new electric arc furnace in the uh, Algoma Steel Facility in Sault Ste. Marie. Speaker, after years of the North being ignored by the previous government, it's great to see our government investing in Northern Ontario. Here, here, here. Speaker, through you, can the minister please tell this House what this investment in Algoma Steel means for Ontarians? Let us know. To reply on behalf of the government, the member for Peterborough, Florida, Parliament. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a good day to rise in this House and talk about the great work that we're doing in Northern Ontario. Last week, the aforementioned ministers were in Sault Ste. Marie to announce funding to help build a new electric arc furnace for Algoma Steel, something that wasn't possible under the energy policies of the previous Liberals. Algoma Steel provides good-paying jobs and materials needed to build cars, technology, transit, hospitals, schools, and community infrastructure. And they're at the heart of Ontario's economic recovery. Investing in jobs in the North has been a priority for this government since day one, and will continue to fight for good-paying jobs and keep them right here in this province. Compare this to the Ontario Liberal Party, who were supported by the NDP. They said no to jobs like the ones at Algoma Steel, and as a result, waved goodbye to 300,000 manufacturing jobs during their time in government. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that impassioned answer. It's great to see that this government is standing up for Ontario jobs and making sure this province remains competitive while we recover from the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. We all know that jobs are a priority for this government, and ensuring we keep jobs intact as we transition to new, greener technology is paramount. We know that we can support jobs while being environmentally friendly, but the approach has to be balanced. So, Speaker, back to the Minister. What does this announcement mean for the environment? Member for Peterborough Fourth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The upgrades being made at Algoma Steel will leverage Ontario's clean energy advantage, 94% clean. It'll provide them with an affordable and reliable supply of clean electricity for years to come. Clean, made in Ontario steel is a central part of Ontario's plan to build, Ontario's plan to build, leveraging domestic production of cars, technology, transit, hospitals, schools, and community infrastructure, and that's at the heart of Ontario's economic recovery. Our government continues to take action to support job creation and investment in environmentally conscious ways for industry across North America, just like we did last week for Algoma Steel. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make strategic investments into the jobs of Northern Ontario because that supports all of this province. Response? The member for Algoma, Manitou. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This weekend, parents and children in North Bay were met by a crowd of angry, megaphone-wielding anti-vax protesters who screamed and cursed at them as they tried to take their kids to get their vaccine. Abby Blaschek took her seven-year-old boy to get his life-saving shot and was screamed at through a megaphone, called a murderer and, thought, and told that getting her boy vaccinated is genocide. Oh. Think about it. This is absolutely unacceptable, Speaker. Families like Abby, Abby's are already stressed enough, and this is only making things worse. We asked you before children's vaccination started to pass the NDP's safety zone legislation to spare families from harassment. Question. Will the government pass this bill by the leader of the NDP today, or will they keep emboldening anti-vaxxers? To reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think uh, uh, the member knows, uh, as we've uh, uh, talked about, that uh, there are already in place uh, significant protections to ensure that uh, that, that uh, people are safe, Mr. Speaker. The uh, the police do have the resources to ensure that. Uh, I think the member is quite uh, correct, though, uh, in his uh, in his assertion that this is completely unacceptable. I think we would all agree, or at least most of us uh, in this chamber. Uh, would agree with the member and uh, with the obvious anger that the member has uh, uh, has expressed uh, in his in his question, Mr. Speaker. It is very, very clear. It should be very clear to everybody uh, that getting a vaccination not only is safe; it is the right way to get us through this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. If you love. Uh, your, uh, your family, if you love uh, freedom, then you should get yourself a shot so that we can all get back to normal, Mr. Speaker. That is the best way for us to get out of this pandemic. And if you're one of those people who thinks that it is somehow smart or uh, intelligent to go out there and protest families doing so, give your head a shake and think about it. Again, to the Premier Speaker, 
Protests like this are exactly why the safety zone legislation we proposed can't wait. This should have been done months ago, Speaker, but the Ford government would rather pander to the anti-vax vote. Children like Abby's son need to this vaccine to stay healthy and keep going to school. And while Abby is relieved her son got the shot, she's worried that he's been traumatized by walking down an alley of hate and misinformation while adults yelled at him through a megaphone. Premier, every day that you delay these important protections is another day parents and kids are potentially at risk of sorts of protests that hurt Abby and her son in North Bay this weekend. Speaker, again through you to the Premier, will you work with us to pass our safety zone legislation and finally commit to keeping our schools and hospitals safe? Uh, again, Speaker, uh, uh, as, as, as noted earlier, the, uh, there are tools already in place for our uh, law enforcement officials to ensure that uh, uh, that people uh, are safe. Uh, uh, speaker, with respect to uh, to pandering, I, I suspect that there are at least uh, a number of our colleagues who uh, would. Uh, uh, feel differently than the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. We have believed right from the beginning that the best way to get beyond this pandemic is to ensure that people get vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. That is why close to 90% of Ontarians have two doses, Mr. Speaker. That is why we are seeing five to 11s really book at an amazing rate, Mr. Speaker. Now look, are there individuals out there who ought to be ought to know better? Absolutely. Are we all angry and frustrated that there are some individuals uh, a very small minority of individuals who are doing this to parents? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. But as I said, we are as angry as the member uh, opposite is. Uh, Response. Uh, but ultimately, the tools, there are tools in place for uh, law enforcement to ensure that all people are safe. And again, Mr. Speaker, the best way for us to get beyond this is to get vaccinated. Thank you. Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker, to the Minister of Health. For a year and a half, this Premier and this government continued draconian measures against Ontarians with lockdowns and mandates. The Premier talks a good game. No one wants to see businesses open more than him. No one loves nurses more than him. He's against passports because it will create a two-tier society. A month ago, the Premier said that vaccine passports will be lifted on January 17, but on November 24th, the head of the science table said that the probability that we drop passports in mid-January is next to zero. So, Speaker, who should Ontarians believe? The Premier, who says vaccine passports will end mid-January, or the head of the science table, who says they won't? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we should believe the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who is the chief person who is advising the government, who is looking at the clinical evidence, is looking at the trends, who's looking at the number of case counts in Ontario, who has said from the beginning when the plan came forward, this is what we are expecting to do. However, if plans change, if there is a sudden increase, if there is a variant that comes in that causes concern, then we will have to change the plan. But the people need to know with uh, what is coming forward. That is what we expect will come forward, subject always to the caveat that the situation might change. But we are doing everything in our power to ensure that the people of Ontario remain safe and healthy. Supplementary question. For reports of aerosol transmission were available as early as spring 2020. We heard that the virus was transmitting through ventilation in New York restaurants as early as summer 2020. In July 2020, the New York Times wrote, yes, the coronavirus is in the air. Also in July 2020, the WHO said that the, that the virus can be airborne indoors. But for two years, Canadian health authorities denied science by suggesting that transmission was droplet. You see, despite discussing ventilation, this government and public health authorities recommended plexiglass everywhere. Businesses spent thousands of dollars while some school boards put students behind a glass box. Four days ago, the head of the science table told Global News that plexiglass may do harm, more harm than good because it prevents ventilation. Does the minister understand that there's no universe in which both plexiglass and ventilation make sense and will she listen to the head of the science table and instruct okay. all places and businesses to remove plexiglass immediately minister of health thank you speaker 
Um, our government has always followed the advice and recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, who is also advised by the Science Table, by Public Health Ontario, and by others. They're epidemiologists. They understand the transmission of this virus. We understand that we need to continue to follow all of the health and safety precautions that we've always followed, wearing a mask indoors or when we're in close contact with people, uh, physical distancing, washing hands, all of those measures will remain in place to keep all of us safe and healthy and so that we can then move on with reopening Ontario. But we're not there yet. We need to continue to get more people vaccinated. That is going to be the most important thing we can do. Ventilation, of course, is always also important, but the most important thing right now is for more people to get vaccinated, and we're asking anyone who's not been vaccinated yet, Response. please do so right away. Sure. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. Good morning. Speaker, Ontario is proud to be home to the largest Jewish community in Canada. Now that the celebration of Hanukkah has begun, this is an excellent time to recognize the tremendous contributions the Jewish community continues to make to Ontario. While this is a time of celebration, sadly, we have also borne witness to a disturbing rise in anti-Semitic hate and hate crimes in our province. This is a solemn reminder that our work to combat anti-Semitism is not done. Can the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism Please inform the House about the actions our government is taking to eliminate racism and hate from Ontario. Why the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism? Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member from Mississauga Centre for that important question, Mr. Speaker. This also allows me the opportunity to wish the Jewish community very happy Hanukkah, Mr. Speaker. And Ontario is, of course, proud to be home to the largest Jewish community here in the country. Uh, our government is honored to stand shoulder to shoulder with our Jewish community and to continue to take strong action determined to fight anti-Semitism, Mr. Speaker. Our government has absolutely zero tolerance when it comes to any form of racism, hate, including anti-Semitism. That is why we're working with our partners like LAD Canada and other community organizations across our great province as we work together to build a stronger, prosperous, and inclusive Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. I also wanted to thank him for recently visiting Mississauga and celebrating Polish Independence Day with our community. Speaker, through you. I know the Jewish community in my riding will be pleased to know about the work our government is doing in collaboration with our community partners to rid Ontario of, of anti-Semitism and hate of all forms. This has never been more important than now, and I am proud to stand on this side of the House and support Jewish communities right across our beautiful province. Now that the Festival of Lights has begun and the menorahs are being lit, can the minister please tell this House what our government is doing to shine a light on racism and hate, wherever it may be hiding. Thank you. Mr. Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for that question again. Uh, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, our government is absolutely committed to doing everything in its power and making the necessary investments that are needed. That's why in our recent fall economic statement, we are announced $8.1 million in additional funding, Mr. Speaker, to fight anti-racism, anti-hate, and introduce initiatives like doubling the anti-racism, anti-hate grant from $1.6 million to $3.2 million. The Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs had to say this, Mr. Speaker, we applaud the government of Ontario for doubling the funding for anti-racism, anti-hate grant program, saying this program is a critical step forward in addressing the rise in anti-Semitism. Our government will always defend the right of every person to practice their faith, live their lives free of intimidation and hate. And I look forward to taking part in the celebration over the holidays, Mr. Speaker, and I want to wish everyone happy Hanukkah once again. Member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Families, and especially, especially women across Ontario, cannot find or afford the childcare that they need to return to work. Even Jason Kenney's Conservatives in Alberta are now working with the federal government to create affordable childcare spaces, while Ontario families wait for this Premier to make a deal. 
I recently heard from Leah, a constituent of mine in Toronto Centre. Leah and her wife are delaying their plans to have a second child because they simply cannot afford to have two children in childcare at the same time. Leah told me, I quote, it doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you want to decrease barriers for, for most mothers getting back to the workforce? End quote. Premier, when can families like Leah finally expect your government to deliver on a deal for $10 a day childcare in Ontario? The Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. You can certainly count on our government to stand up for Ontario's interests and children who want a fair deal from the federal government. We have met with the federal government now twice with the aim of landing a deal, one that delivers on $10 a day child care, which is what the federal government has committed to for the people of this province. Uh, well, obviously, we're ensuring that we get the requisite investment to achieve $10 a day, not $20 or $30 or $40 a day, which I just think all of us would agree is not what the Fed's committed to. So we're working with them constructively to do that. We're making the case for more sustainability and more flexibility to support moms and dads across Ontario who need this support. We know child care is too expensive. The former Liberal government has a disastrous record of increasing child care costs by 400 percent over their tenure. 40 percent above the national average. Obviously, that's unacceptable. Our Premier is committed to reducing costs, increasing access, which is why we're at the table making the case for a fair deal, the lowest cost for all families in this province. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Leah's family doesn't want to wait for this government to negotiate a deal that favours private, big-box childcare, where taxpayers' subsidized profits go to shareholders. When I asked Leah about this, she said, and I quote, I don't think my child's care should be profited off of. It creates shady motivations with worse child care worker ratios." End quote. Families like Leah's are being clear with this government. They expect you to deliver a deal for affordable, high-quality, publicly funded, not-for-profit child care in Ontario. When will this government stop shirking your responsibilities to Ontario families, invest in affordable child care, and sign a deal that gets $10 a day child care for families in Ontario? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Unlike the New Democrats and Liberals who believe they know best for how parents raise their children, 24 per cent of operators in this province are independently managed. They do a good job, and they support access for families across Ontario. I would never denigrate hardworking child care operators in the province of Ontario, as the NDP just did. But what I will say is every single family deserves support from this federal government. We know that they currently contribute roughly 2.5 per cent of Ontario's allocation for child care. They've got to do much more, which is why we're at the table to make the case for a fair deal that gets prices down to $10 for families. When you reflect on the legacy of the former Liberals under the Dil Duca Liberals, where child care rose by 400 per cent, Obviously, every government, provincially, federally, and municipally, have to work together to get these prices down, which is precisely what we're doing, Speaker. Uh, by meeting with them, presenting our data, and making the case for more flexibility, more investment to deliver on a imperative Response. of this government, which is affordability and increased access for all parents in this province. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, on, and on behalf of our members, I want to just say thank you to Tanya Granham. Thank you for all the work that you've done over the years. Thank you for training me when I was a new MPP on committee. Um, speaker, my question is for the Premier and Minister of Education. Um, the holiday season can be a warm and happy time of year, Mr. Speaker. It can also be a time of anxiety and worry, as we all know. This year, once again, we're all living with a degree of apprehension as COVID continues to be a threatening, morphing reality. I can remember as a young mom in the lead up to Christmas juggling all the needs and expectations of my three kids, balancing my work in and outside of the ho home, and that feeling of ex exhaustion. But, Speaker, my worries were not about whether my kids would be fed or whether they would have gifts under the tree. My worries were not about who was going to look after them when I was at work. But those are exactly the worries of thousands of families across this province. Year in and year out, mothers in particular struggle to make arrangements for their children. When it's holiday time, those struggles are amplified. The gaps seem wider and more insurmountable. And in the middle of the night, the fear of not being able to look, to look after your kids adequately can be a really dark pit. Speaker, I know that the answer Question. from the minister will include a spin on what our government did or did not do while in office. But here's the thing, Speaker. Never for one moment in our time in office did we have a federal government putting $30 billion on the table to reduce child care costs in Ontario. Why has this government not yet signed a child care deal with the federal government? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is just a matter of fact that under the tenure of the Alduca Liberals, child care rose by 400 percent. 
That is indefensible, and I think everyone would recognize in this legislature, Speaker, that families paid the price for that neglect where it was inaccessible and unaffordable for too many moms and dads in Ontario. That is their legacy, one which the people of Ontario rejected in the last election, which is why our government in the first budget introduced a, uh, a tax credit for families to help them save money, uh, roughly $1,500 a year. We know, Speaker, there's more to do, which is why we enhanced it during the pandemic. It's why we continue to stand, uh, sit at the federal, with the federal government to make the case to get that deal, which I think all families want, so long as Response. it is equitable, it is sustainable, and it gets us to $10 a day, that's exactly what we're making the case to the federal government. And I'm proud that the Premier is standing up for the people of this province. And the supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, I could spend a lot of time in this House railing against the inaccuracies that come from that side of the House about what our government did or didn't do, but that's not my job. I know that's my job, not my job. My job is to advocate for the people I represent and for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And it was encouraging last week when we learned that the minister was going to be meeting with federal officials uh, to hammer out a child care agreement. But that has not happened. And I know firsthand, Mr. Speaker, that negotiations between provincial and federal governments can be slow and they can be frustrating. But, Speaker, this federal government has been able to sign agreements with most of the other provinces and territories in the country. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know Ontario is special. It's very special. But families in Windsor or Thunder Bay are not so very different from families in Calgary or Halifax. They all need childcare that they can afford. Is the government serious Question. about signing an agreement? And when can we expect to hear that families in Ontario will share from the benefits of the $30 billion federal commitment? Mr. Of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we absolutely are looking forward to landing a fair deal for the people of Ontario. It's why for the past week we've been negotiating in good faith to achieve that objective. Uh, but I will say, Speaker, I, I think it is unacceptable that when you had over a decade of the privilege to serve the people of Ontario, it's not that child care just remains static. Dolly West will come to order. Minister of Education to reply. It's not the member opposite you know, that child care just remains static. It's that it actually got 400% worse under your tenure. That is your legacy. A families that weren't able to access child care in communities Order. small and large and the most expensive child care in Canada. That is Remember your Ottawa, legacy. South, come it to is order. Government side, come to order. This Premier is absolutely committed to getting a deal that reduces costs, that increases access. I was proud to stand with the Stop minister. The clock. Stop the clock. Members, take a seat. I realize members have uh, strong opinions about this issue, but we still have to have a civil debate. And uh, I'm going to ask the Minister of Education to resume his answer. Please start the clock. Uh, Speaker, we, uh, the Minister of Infrastructure and I just last week announced an additional 3,000 spaces, childcare spaces, affordable spaces in schools. We have a plan to build 30,000 over five years. Mr. Speaker, what? last year alone, 16,000 spaces were created, 19,000 the year prior. We know there's much more work to do after the disastrous legacy of the former Liberal government. We're going to work hard to get a fair deal for the families we serve in this province. The next question, member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Environment. Uh, last week, the Auditor General released a scathing report on this government's failed environmental performance. The Auditor General also reported, and I quote, when the Environment Minister first identified concerns about pollution from a spill in Hamilton's Shadok Creek in July 2018, neither the Environment Ministry nor the City of Hamilton informed the public about its magnitude. 24 billion litres of sewage spilled over four years. Two years ago, I rose in this House to ask why the ministry chose to leave Hamilton in the dark. The answer from this government? It wasn't the ministry's role. Now the Auditor General is stating the obvious. Of course, the Ministry of Environment has a role in ensuring the public is aware of spills in their community. So, Speaker, my question, will the minister apologize to the people of Hamilton for keeping this spill in the dark? Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to 
rise to answer a question. The first question I would add, uh, the critic in the NDP has posed on the environment. Very glad to rise to answer uh, that question. Uh, speaker, we understand, obviously, um, the, the impact that spills have across the province of Ontario. That's why, as a government, we've taken a decisive action. The, the new Environment Compliance Hub Ontario is embracing a modern science, modern technology to respond uh, better to spills as, uh, as we take decisive action across the province of Ontario. I think to uh, recent funding initiatives that I've been a part of across uh, the region and that member's region uh, to support in better responding to spills. I'll also uh, add that Budget 2020 improved uh, wastewater management um, and committed funds to support municipalities uh, to better hand handle spills. I know um, that the municipality of, of Hamilton, where that member hails from, um, has had, uh, without question, challenges, and we're working closely with that uh, municipality to improve uh, their wastewater management, and I'll have more to say in supplementary. Thank Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's unfortunate that the minister chooses not to apologize to the people of Hamilton for keeping him in, in the dark, but it's not just the people of Hamilton who are suffering under this government's abysmal track record on the environment. Um, in the same damning report the Auditor General writes, and I quote, the environment ministry is also not recovering its costs from responding to spills, resulting in taxpayers and not the spillers paying for spills. The auditor estimates that hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars have been spent cleaning up the messes polluters made. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister please stop denying and deflecting his responsibility and work with the opposition and work with community groups to keep Ontarians and their environments safe? Again, to respond, Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker. Again, appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to rise to answer uh, this question. Again, we, we value the input from the Auditor General and value her recommendations. That's why, after a decade of inaction, a decade under which we saw a disastrous ability for Ontarians to work with their government to respond to spills, we know over 93,000 spills are reported uh, to the Ministry each year and all get responded to by dedicated staff. Each one varies in nature. Um, some are more uh, serious than others, but it's dedicated scientists, it's dedicated leaders on the ground who are responding to this, and we're working closely, but we're not st stopping uh -huh. there. Um, of, uh, you know, municipal sewage systems consist of treatment plants and collection systems that are designed to convey and treat uh, sanitary or combined sewage. We invested over $20 uh, million in budget uh, to address that. Perhaps Response? that member would stop heckling and listen, member for... and she might learn something. The mem member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas must come to order. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health. Last week, I asked the Minister about the lives lost as a result of the government's pandemic response. For the first time, last Monday, the Minister of Health admitted that lives were lost, not just from COVID, but as a consequence of the government's pandemic response. To be clear, lockdowns, increases in overdoses, a mental health catastrophe, delayed cancer diagnosis, and surgeries postponed by this government also cost lives. Does the minister accept responsibility for those lives, and can she tell the legislature how many lives were lost as a result of her actions, directly or indirectly? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, what I can tell the member is that our goal from the very beginning of this pandemic is to protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians. And every action that we've taken has been to do just that. Vaccination was the most important thing, but in the beginning we didn't have vaccination. We had to care for people in our hospitals, care for people with COVID, care for people with other issues. We had to delay some of the, the uh, surgeries because our hospitals were full. So every step that we've taken since then, including with the vaccinations, has been to protect and save lives. We've got over uh, close to 90% of population age 12 and over vaccinated with the first dose, 87% with the second dose. We're working with children age 5 to 11. We're going to be accelerating the age limits for the, for the booster dose. As we're dealing with the original Delta variant, we have got Omicron. We're trying to contain that right now and make sure that it doesn't spread with the goal of saving as many people as possible in the province of Ontario. Uh, that is our responsibility, and that's exactly what we're doing. Supplementary question. Back to the Minister, we all want to save lives. 
That's precisely the subject of my question. Lives were lost as a result of this government's pandemic response. It's a welcome but overdue admission. The increase in overdose, late cancer diagnoses, delayed surgeries, and one of the harshest and lockdowns, longest lockdowns in the world resulted in the death of countless Ontarians. The human toll of the government's response is the responsibility of this government. Ontarians should know how many people died as a result of the actions of this minister, but apparently there are no studies, no estimates, no thinking that actually went into assessing whether the response is deadlier than the pandemic itself. We know that uh, Public Health Ontario told us that the increase in overdose among people under 50 is three times greater than all people that die from COVID. Excess mortality, according to Statistics Canada, is three to one. How does the minister justify imposing deadly lockdowns without measuring Question. or estimating how many lives may be saved and how many lives may be lost as a result of the catastrophe she and the Premier perpetuated against the province of Ontario? Minister of Health to reply. To the member opposite, every step that our government has taken to deal with this pandemic has weighed the pros and cons of what the effect on the general population is going to be. But we know for a fact that the vaccination is the most important thing that we do right now, and we have a very successful vaccination rate in the province of Ontario and one of the lowest cases rates in the world right now. So we are taking steps, we are moving forward, we are making sure that we don't leave anybody behind though, because we know that we have had to postpone some surgeries. We've put over half a billion dollars into catching up with those surgeries, into making sure that our operating rooms can operate as many hours as possible, to make sure they can operate on weekends, over the in, into the evening. We've also invested $3.8 billion into our mental health and addiction system with a roadmap to wellness. We know that we need to put more resources there because we know Response. that many people, because of COVID-19, because of job losses, for a lot of other reasons, are experiencing significant mental health and addiction issues. That is what we have been turning our attention to, even as we're trying to manage the vaccination rate to make sure that no Ontarian gets left behind. Member for London West. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, families in London West are still waiting desperately for autism services for their kids. Virginia is a mom to two children with autism. One of her sons was among the 600 children selected for the OAP core clinical services pilot, but she's not allowed to use the funding that was deposited into her account for the life skills supports her son requires. Meanwhile, her other son, who urgently needs needs clinical services is one of almost 50,000 Ontario children forced to wait for needs-based funding. Speaker, when will this government stop ignoring the needs of children with autism and start providing them with the actual services they urgently require? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the, the question to the member opposite. This is, uh, uh, has been an endeavour that our government has been committed to since the beginning of our mandate to address a long-standing neglect of children with autism and their families. And this is exactly why we doubled the funding from $300 million to $600 million. It's why we're implementing a world-leading program that has been created by the autism community for the autism community. This is a program that is comprehensive. It is needs-based. It is family and child centre. We've incorporated uh, behavioural therapy, including the ABA. Uh, we've also included mental health, speech-language pathology. This is a needs-based program that uses nine domains of need to understand how we best serve the needs Response. of children. So this is something that is going to serve tens of thousands of children. Uh, we are making sure this is rolling out. We are on target, and we are getting the feedback from the 600 children that are now enrolled. Thank you for your question. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 23, an act to amend the Residential Tenancies Act 2006 to implement various measures to stabilize rent. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes, and I will ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies.